So thank you everyone who's um, tuning in to watch. Uh, once again, if you don't know, my name is Kellen and this is Killing for Company. And today we're going back to do a episode on death metal. Specifically, this is a return to my 2000s death metal series um, called Cut Your Teeth. There's a bunch of different episodes I have in the past on the subject, but this one was spurred recently by something that uh, came up on the heavy metallurgy end of year stream. So uh, I've got something playing in the background here, but I think that's mostly for my comfort. We're gonna be talking about dead congregation today. So I have uh, promulgation of the fall playing in the background here, but you probably won't be able to make that out. So it'll just be for my personal comfort. So what are we talking about today? Outside of Dead Congregation, well, today, the January, you should be watching this on January 30th, marks the 16th year anniversary uh, for the release of this album, um, Graves of the Archangels. And I wanted to, to um, spotlight this record because every time the subject surrounding sort of death metal and where it is today. Every time the subject comes up, um, I'm always referencing the debut full length for uh, from Dead Congregation. And there's there's reason for that, but so in, in con, you know, in an attempt to celebrate the record and talk about it was sort of my initial impulse. On top of that, I also wanted to take a moment to sort of muse a little bit on what Marty posed to the panelists, which was, you know, I think I'm paraphrasing here, but has the death metal bubble burst? And you know, that's uh, the, the panelists all like, you know, they took their crack at answering that question and you're on the spot, it's just sort of friendly conversation, right? Um, but it's something that, it's a subject, good question, right? But kind of difficult to calculate, like the, the scope of that. But I also want to spend some time talking about essentially a, a little bit of that question, right? So um, where do I kind of see death metal today now? I, I feel very, uh, this is going to try something new here. And um, I've got a, sort of a little presentation that I'll throw up for us to look at while I'm going through the first part of this presentation. So for those who are interested, um, the early part of this conversation is really going to be answering that question as to sort of death metal today and what's going on with it. And then the latter portion of this video will be sort of honoring the contribution of dead congregation and how they tie into the conversation as a whole. Um, so let me throw that up here for us. All right. So there, there we have our, our little title. Um, Echoes from the grave of what I'm calling this video. And, uh, the impact and influence of their debut full length. So um, from here, as I mentioned, um, let's kind of talk, you know, more specifically about what the questions are. Right. It, it was interesting. I don't know if I saw all sorts of end of year conversation with the major, I would say, success stories um, that got a lot of attention were the last horrendous record and the two mold record from 2023. Um, which prompted, you know, there was a lot of support and praise for them, but at the same time, uh, some detractors uh, who, who can made some bold statements about expressing their potential frustration or disappointment or whether it was, I think a, a magazine album cover to, um, I think just an overall shift in terms of what death metal sounds like. 
nonetheless, uh, there seemed to be, it was a noticeable um, point of conversation I felt towards the end of the year. And, you know, Marty's question was, has it started to fade? Um, and, you know, by extension, I kind of threw in a couple of other uh, questions for this topic, which, you know, where is it going and how did we get here? So the latter there, the, the last question is what I want to talk about um, as it relates to dead congregation and sort of the sense of fatigue that has been building for the genre for me personally. Um, if you're watching this, you may object to these questions or uh, think they don't need to be addressed. But for me personally, like I immediately connected with that sentiment. Um, I, I have been on a personal note, a bit frustrated um, with the, the amount, not just the amount of records coming out, but a certain kind of likeness that they share. Um, so why that is, hopefully I will be able to draw sort of a connective narrative, you know, looking more holistically um, at the scene and, and where it is today. So let's focus on that last question. How did we get here? So I'm starting for this conversation um, at the end of the sort of end of the 90s as we get into the 2000s. Um, the things that I think most people associate with the, the genre, I mean, early 90s, I don't think is questioned as being sort of this peak era, right, um, for the genre. But what I have here are, you know, some years in question. So from 1998 to 2008, of course, we're, you're going to be able to debate these, um, this time period and even the labels that I've highlighted. Um, but what I am hoping to draw is some at least general sense, right? Um, and then a key factor for me is also going to be cultural impact, right? So this isn't trying to find the most underground bands from the time period um, or even underground labels for that matter, but it is trying to at least um, bring to, to light some of the major players and major releases. So 98 to 2008 is what I've chosen here. And then themes. Rapidity, effusiveness, and irreverence are the themes that I'm going for. And these are like general themes that you can find um, from bands from this time period. Uh, I think if people are pressed to identify what they associate with this particular time period for death metal, they're going to kind of say it was like a brutal tech death era, and they're not necessarily wrong. Um, I've spent some time on my channel trying to highlight the exceptions to the rule. Um, but I also think it is important to point out like this is pervade, like the pervasive sort of idea about what death mall was in the, at the time period. So uh, now unique leader and willow tip sort of as labels align themselves a bit more closely with this time period, but like relapse is an example um, other ones that come to mind would be like earache and uh, century media. Those labels get started at a much earlier time period um, than 1998. And they signed and put out a lot of important bands that sort of contributed through the 90s into the um, 2000s. But I think for the most part, for me as an American, right, that's another something that's going to be sort of important to keep track of is that I'm very much looking at this as a 
teenager into my early twenties. Um, and, uh, you know, living here in America, that definitely shaped what I had access to the bands that were being promoted, what was highlighted, what I could go see live, et cetera. So a lot of these picks will be a bit more informed by geography, um, not just sort of history, but uh, those are the central factors, right? Like here are the key players, the key themes for me um, that really tie a lot of these records together. And just for the sake of conversation, you know, I picked 10 releases. So go to my next slide here. Um, here are just sort of 10 general records uh, from the labels that I've shown. And I think they kind of demonstrate my point, um, obviously to kind of reiterate, there are probably more underground band, brand, bands during this time period, but here are some key players from important labels. Um, and the, the reason I, I'm going to this length to try and set up the conversation is uh, you had, there was a lot, this was a lot of polarizing, maybe is a good way to phrase it. Like this sound um, turned a lot of death metal fans off. Um, and I, I think that's something that we need to keep track of moving forward is there is a key departure here. There's enough of a tech death influence during this time period, at least to sort of shape sort of a cultural understanding of what the genre was. Um, and that is going to be important when we kind of take a, or steer uh, death metal in a different direction when we come to a different time period coming up. Um, but I, I think I, I, it's important to take note of when we are talking about the general kind of fatigue that we're experiencing today, this is something that we need to keep track of because previously this was where the fatigue was, right? Um, it was, you want to call it trendy? You could. I don't think death metal during this time period um, is popular or cool in the same way, right? Like in some ways between the digital album artwork um, and a lot of the production choices, I, and a lot of people could say it was like a low point in the genre's history. So just want to keep track of, you know, what we're making comparisons to. And this is a general idea of what I'm talking about. Okay. So last year, I have uh, some points of discussion for us, right? And this will kind of frame you know, a little bit, a bit of culture history for us, an era when internet and digital media becomes the dominant form of music consumption, where we get our information. I mean, I remember, you know, I had my Mac and had LimeWire and stuff like that. Um, the arrival of YouTube, MySpace, like I'm old enough to remember when MySpace first emerged as like the social media deal. And then turned into a uh, place where bands would use to like advertise their, their records. Like it completely kind of lost touch of a social media platform and it served only to highlight sort of the role of her bands. Um, Encyclopedia Metallum. So all of that sort of music consumption now becomes a bit more available to everyone in a way that, in the previous decade, you know, from let's say 88 to 98, uh, wasn't as accessible. Um, and like I mentioned before, uh, digital artwork, production values, um, influenced this generation of death metal. Uh, it office places them in odds um, with many of the iconic sort of bands, their records from the late 80s and early 90s. That pushback, um, you know, for the themes about like effusiveness and playing this brutal tech style, it was in some regard a way that bands were trying to push towards new sort of 
frontiers, I think that's important to keep track of. Um, the genre still have the idea that it could had room to grow and could progress towards something. You know, and even if that was like, we're just going to play faster and louder than the band that came before us. Um, and it ended up sort of serving as a conversation of diminishing returns, right? Like did they did not have the same kind of shelf life and the music didn't have the same kind of impact potentially that the icon iconic like golden age of death metal did before them. So um, how we view that going forward is something that I think is really interesting um, just because as time passes, you know, we're looking at almost two decades, you know, in some regards over two decades from this era. Um, I wonder if death metal and history start to view this differently. definitely am championing that sort of cause um, because one, it's something that I have a certain degree of like emotional connection to being a teenager in my twenties, but to kind of go back to the original question here is this, it became so technical and so over the top that people were hungry for a change, all right? And that's when this next batch kind of, of death metal arrives. So here's the next sort of group that I have set aside for us. Um, death metal labels as the tides begin to turn. Um, you know, the themes I'm talking 2006 to 2015 here. Once again, these are sort of general years in terms of time frame, And then themes, gravity, texture, mysticism. Um, the, the thing that I remember most about this time period was that the death metal got darker. It got heavier. Um, and I don't know if it was the influence that and visibility that the second wave of black metal had during the 2000s, once it became much more sort of visible to the general like populace or death metal fans who were interested in the underground. But it just, it got, um, it felt like it was no longer about the kind of instrumental sort of thrust towards something to a, a different dimension. It was much more about, you know, trying to rediscover um, a different kind of like connection to the songs, to the albums and bands that were being signed to the labels here. You know, I don't know if many people think of Nuclear War now as a death metal label. Um, a lot of their earlier stuff, for the most part, is kind of on the black death spectrum. But obviously, um, Profound Lore and Dark Descent. Um, Profound Lore comes around a little bit earlier than Dark Descent. And, you know, all these labels, I think, are still relevant today in a way that potentially a, a label like Unique Leader um, and definitely not Relapse uh, are in terms of speaking to a modern sort of death metal audience. So if like you're in your 20s now, right? You, you're whatever, 19, 20 years old and you're into death metal, like you're still going to be picking up records from Profound Lore and Dark Descent in a way that I don't think you are necessarily with uh, Unique Leader and Willow Tip. I mean, I still, you know, I don't really consider Relapse to be much of a death metal label at all anymore. Um, Unique Leader... Every once in a while, you know, they'll catch my eye. Willow Tip, they're still kind of a bit more on the tech desk side, but putting out bands that I know and love. Um, but I mean, 
at this point, Profound Lore, Dark Descent, Nuclear War Now, you're far more likely to find, I think, younger fans, even fans my age in their you know late 30s, um, gravitating towards bands from these labels. Uh, glimpse. So here are some key releases off these labels. Um, I do also want to tie in here, like the conversation surrounding um, texture is is a big piece for me. Like the way the guitar sounded um, fundamentally changed, and that spoke to not only the weight that they carried. But I think because they were no longer interested in terms of moving as quickly or as in the same with the same kind of complexity, um, they could really focus on sort of the tonal density of the record and the guitar sound. And that's something that still, I think, is persistent today. Um, and like you get into some of these more ambitious, obviously, there's a portal and a mitochondrion release there. I mean, there's plenty of bands that were signed to profound lore at during this time period that were almost kind of like in a experimental death metal sound. And those two bands definitely fit the bill. Um, it's interesting. You look at the last two there, Phobocosm and Cruciamentum, like here we just come out now almost a, a decade later with their new records. Um, and, uh, it, it, the, the response that they had, like those, they still speak to, I think, modern fans, um, even though these, those records and kind of their peak period in a lot of ways was a, a long time ago, but in the sense of being like a decade ago. Um, anyway, so here's some to kind of to drive home the point about what kind of sound was popular at this time period. And, We'll kind of move here into the sort of our conversation pieces. Okay. Um, this is also the sort of the vinyl time period, right? I, I can remember, you know, I think my, I inherited my father's old record player when I like around 2007, 2008. So it definitely like puts me in the crosshairs here. Um, Spotify, like streaming launches, Bandcamp. Um, right, I don't know if this is where the uh, OSDM or cavernous sound, like I don't know where those terms generate or who started them, uh, but I think it'd almost be fair to say like, this is the, the time period, right? And if you think about that, we've been having, and this is, to get back to that question, like as much as it was a breath of fresh air to hear a cultural shift within death metal, you know, these records were heavier, darker, um, tried to get underneath your skin and as opposed to just kind of wow you with their proficiency, you know, the same impact and i think when we talk about you know this here the same impact that this record made um i think in some ways like to why it's so important is we're still talking a lot about the same stuff um i, I think that's kind of my my point here is with while as refreshing as this was back in 2008, um, I think in a lot of ways it has become a very stale uh, sound altogether. And I'll go back to my slide here, but if we, we want to say that 
right now the death metal bubble, right? That bubble, when we say that, I think we're talking about what got started here. So now we're talking about, you know, we're celebrating 16 years for Graves of the Archangels. Um, and we're still having this conversation. So, but I, I, I do think it is fair to say that this is the time period in which if you, you know, hate the terms old school death metal or in cavernous, I totally get it. Um, but to deny that they are playing a role in a, today's sort of lexicon of how we understand and define death metal. I think that's also disingenuous. So moving from there. So I've got this dead congregation playing in the background. I'm going to switch it up and move to a different sound. So this is a band that uh, shares members with a uh, dead congregation. And um, let me pull myself up here. There we go. So we're going to switch it up. And this is going to be um, In Veracity. This is released on Unmatched Brutality Records. Um, but Circle of Perversion, it's got that Jalo kind of album artwork there. But we'll switch it up. And this is going to be a little bit of going back to, I guess, a, a, an era of death metal that I love. But we will be talking about in veracity a little bit later when we get to dead congregation and that album review. Nonetheless, we'll take a quick moment. Okay. So let's take this from this particular era and move into what I think is sort of the next phase of death metal. Okay. A crack in the dam, man. I cannot tell you like I'm rocking that tribulation shirt now from the whore this was like this was a big deal and to have young bands that were playing in a style that was so decidedly kind of classic early 90s death metal like it seems so redundant um, at this point in time and it kind of pisses me off. Like, I just, it's lost. There was just this great moment at around, you know, I think 2000. I mean, these are not the first records from, like, say, Obliteration or Necrovation there. It's not the first record from Vastum. Um, but this felt like it was a, just a cool time period for death metal to see really young bands kind of come into the fray and like bring something that was like an energy and an excitement to death metal during this time period. And, you know, as much as like, I think the conversation surrounding oversaturation can, you can point that, you know, gun at every single genre right now and you'd probably you know maybe exceptions would be like epic doom or something like that but you can you know point that criticism towards a lot of different genres and you'd be right but i just want to take a moment to pause here because these records were really important um at least for me personally in sort of shaping this kind of momentum that death metal was building and you look at these bands now like obviously horrendous you know they've had been a, one of the defining bands in terms of popularity over the past decade um you know obliteration never really i don't know if it's being from norway or being on indie records but um i don't know what it is obviously tribulation has changed their sound tremendously 
Um, Vastum's still kicking around. They're doing their thing. And then uh, probably one, like Vastum here is the one 20 bucks spin sort of example. Um, but Necrovation kind of dissolved. Morbus Cron is now Sweven, but that you know band put out two records and then kind of fell apart. But these releases, for me personally at least, are like stand out um, and continue to sort of drive home at least at this point in time in my mind. You know, I'm in my um, around mid 20s, around 2010. So at this point in time, like I, I was kind of excited, I have to say. Like there was still a lot of um, whatever, you know, was posed in that question about the bubble being burst. Man, it, there was a, just excitement here. There was no sense of fatigue that there is with the genre today. So, but we're talking about a decade ago again. So, the flood to follow, like all the different labels during the time period that, you know, I think because of the way that we listen to music, and I've got Rotted Life, I'm into more, Blood Harvest, obviously, like. But Harvest has been around for a lot longer. 20 bucks been, you know, a little bit earlier as well. Memento Mori. Um, Misako Noho has just, like, come around the same time that uh, they have a partnership with, I believe, Dark Descent. So these records um, labels were had been around long for longer, but I really think they seized and capitalized on sort of this explosion of death metal fascination that was happening at the time period. Um, and then you, you know, just to continue that, um, death metal ascendant and overflowing, right? So if I had to choose at least with an underground metal over the past decade, what has been the prevailing sort of genre and cultural zeitgeist, it's definitely death metal. And here, like, you know, head splits been around for a while. Even so is Caligari, but um, you know, they're putting out tapes. You know, it's this whole other aspect of uh, death metal culture that comes into the play. It comes into play primitivism, regression, and secularism. It's even uglier, slower, more simplistic. Um, but I think they even pull away from the kind of ritualism and mysticism that you saw preceding them. This feels much more interested in like body horror, um, Italian horror cinema. So those gore aspects, um, sci-fi. Those are, to me, the, the dominant themes that you find in um, death metal today. I don't think it's as much about the kind of, like, dark spiritual sort of connection with the music. Um, I, I, that I, I do associate that with some of the bands that were coming from, like, Profound Lore and Nuclear War Now um, and Dark Descent. Like, those, those records felt like they were trying to dig into your guts and your heart and your soul. This is a little bit more to me like i don't want to say devoid of like sincerity but there's something very much about this time period to me that's like i want you to enjoy how gross our our riffs are um as and it's not trying to make like an, a spiritual appeal where i think that did happen before they were trying to get into your heart and mind in a different way maybe it's just because there's so much of it now that that's the way i think of it like I, I don't get a chance to internalize it but like the new crip worm or 
cerebral rod or here's some of the examples i pulled up for us to take a quick look at and once again this is just 10 records um so like i don't think that flesh rot or um dipagus ectoplasma like i don't think they're they want the same kind of religious connotation or spiritual connotation. I think that's a, a clear point to separate the generations for me is that is also for me part of the, I don't want to say something that I miss necessarily, but like upon reflecting as to what separates this dead congregation release from me, and bands of this ilk in that time period around 2008, 2009, was there, there was a certain kind of like spiritual connection or, or an attempt to appeal to a different kind of listening experience. It was what I'm trying to say there. And I don't feel that way about um, a lot of these records, right? I don't think, you know, Manner of Infinite Forms was trying to do that. And I'm, I'm obviously there's, there's, Plenty of releases that you can. There's ten records here. I feel like every single year we could have twenty-five death metal records that people listen to and enjoy. So, but in closing, I kind of want to wrap up this section before we get into our last pieces. Um, is it really only a question of oversaturation at this point? And I think that was kind of what people hinted out during the heavy metallurgy stream is, um, you know, that it's now cassettes, zines have kind of come back into um, making up something of, of the death metal sort of like experience, right? If you're into this stuff now. So that part of iconic 1980s, 1990s death metal is trying to resurface. Um, and stuff that is was previously demo tapes and really rare singles, et cetera. Now that is accessible in a way that never was before. Um, and because it's popular or trendy, I think for a lot, I mean, just for a lot of people, you kind of have to go to that extent to, to gain something from this particular time period and genre is you're having to go to that extent in order to make it feel relevant. Um, so I kind of, the, the last point for me is, um, is there a point where this kind of nostalgia um, towards early nineties, late eighties death metal can be exhausting? <laughs> I just wonder if it's, um, you know, nostalgia isn't something that is something that we are attempting to experience, right? As much as we are like trying to just repackage. And that sounds incredibly cynical, um, but I can't help but feel like that right now. That once the sort of that, that knowledge is we're trying to sort of reproduce that same time of kind of time period, um, at least with death metal. And I think initially it had, for me, you know, it had a whole lot of, um, interest and enthusiasm that went into it. But at this point in time, man, it is, I am so exhausted on it on a personal level. So yeah, I'm burnt out on it, but you know, the reason I wanted to sort of approach this as a full, you know, at a much larger conversation was to give the kind of context here, right? Like, um, People were really, at this time period around 2008, 
you know, to, to kind of go back and look at these earlier slides, like people were really burnt out on this style of death metal. Um, and it, because they had exhausted so many extremes during this sort of brutal tech death era, when we got the next round of, you know, bands, these key releases that like I'm talking about today, like this was really important for death metal. Uh, it's, it's hard for me to sort of overstate that, but this felt like an incredible time period for the genre. And it's a, there's a real reason why, um, we saw so many new bands, new labels, new fans. Like it was a special time period. But at this point, we've been having the same conversation now for over a decade. And I am really ready for, you know, something else to come along and change things. Um, so, for as much as you know, I've kind of talked about this to death. I do want to, you know, kind of give that context before we jump into why this record was so important. So let's go back here and I'll jump in to this release. So man um before i do that let's switch up some records and we're going to put on so uh something by, from nuclear winter another band that should play into our conversation today okay so we are going to listen to this is from 2022 on nuclear winter records this is uh embrace of thorns with entropy dynamics Nuclear Winter, if you don't know, are the label um, that is owned by the uh, singer and vocalist for uh, the congregation. So probably my favorite uh, sort of black death band right now. And... Uh, also has connection. I think a lot of their uh, earlier records came through on Nuclear War now. So there's a connection there with Dead Congregation. Okay. So let's move into Grave of the Archangels. Um, man, to kind of follow up that statement, this sounded, you know, initially back in 2008 when I first heard it. Um, it, it came around and really there were other bands who were doing it, but you know, the, the point of this video is to also talk about cultural impact, not necessarily be the first to do the sound, but the scope and influence of the record. And I think more than any other band from, you know, their peers, it comes out when the first Necrovation record comes out, the first father of comes out in 2008 bands like, uh, Funebrarum, you know, their first record is early 2000s, but I don't, it was not nearly as visible and impactful as when, in, in my, to my memories, when Graves of the Archangels came out in 2008. So, um, every single time we talk about the subject of oversaturation within death metal and um, just how there's, so many new records and new bands you can't keep up keep up with it and all that kind of stuff um it all kind of sounds the same yada yada. all those complaints my mind always runs back to this record and to me it is the release that so many bands are still chasing the, the you know to be as impactful and as important as uh graves of the archangels i think it was always sort of the high watermark for the genre. And I think what's interesting is dead congregation has not been a prolific band by any means. Right. 
So the fact that this record, for me at least personally, serves as um, being the standard with the band not constantly being in circulation, I, I don't. Some people could make the case that potentially could help them and be them make them more of a more of a, a cult band, but they're not a, a, a secret at this point in time. I, I do think it is one of those records that was so good um, and so good early on that um, it is still sort of leader uh, or on the throne for me in terms of this style. So a little bit about this band. Obviously, not their first release the EP and a demo that came out. A consistent theme that Dead Congregation has had throughout their career is a lot of independent releases, you know, whether through martyrdom um, or uh, releasing something independently. Now, obviously, they have Nuclear Winter. Um, they've gone through different distribution channels. You know, they got Nuclear War now and. Um, here, uh, even but like their second release um, through Modernum, been distro through major death metal labels, but that's a consistent theme throughout their career is sort of independent channels and independent releases. So 2005, you get their EP. And um, while released in 2007, a, a rehearsal demo, and then we get to Graves the Archangels. I wanted to talk about some things that sort of make this record um, important. The I mentioned earlier that these were kind of uh, records that had a little bit more of a like a ritual and mysticism. That long intro, um, when I first heard it, felt like something very different. Um, immediately, instead of this, you don't get like a blasting sort of attack that comes in. It is a little bit more of a okay, I have to get into the, the feel of this record. I have to sort of fall into the flow of things. And that at least drives home for me like the, the ritualism aspect of this record is it comes in with that kind of long, drawn-out, wailing guitar intro. In that regard, it, it felt almost a little bit more in terms of like the experience, right? Like that's the crossover for me at the time period with, with black metal is it wasn't just like we're going to get down to work sort of death metal riffage. Um, you had to sort of like fall into the rhythm of this release and, and let it sort of soak you into the world that is building around you. And uh, there's that brief sort of orthodox prayer um, that comes in on the intro track before it actually gets into the, the songs. And that also kind of threw me for a, a a loop right like i think it, it just drives home the fact that there is like a spiritual element to this band and um to avoid sort of that association i think would be selling the band short so it's 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 i mean the intro is five minutes long and uh then it jumps into the, the first songs um but it, it is i would say before just to kind of my closing point here is like while this didn't sound like a, a portal release or a mitochondrian release but like you think about like impetuous rituals also happening at the time period the more sort of uh shapeless if you will death metal bands like there is something about here that is exploring spiritualism 
that definitely you weren't getting on like a, a spawn of possession record or an Anata record. Um, bands that I love, but just totally different kind of world, right? And uh, even like in Veracity, right? These are members who are uh, played in a brutal tech death, death band from Greece. But this is like altogether a fundamentally different artistic vision for what it's supposed to sound like. performance of this record um walks the line between two different eras um so when people talk about death metal from this time period bringing up incantation and immolation is impossible to avoid that kind of northeast dark sinister heavy you know, death metal sound is a fundamental piece back then in 2008, as it is in 2024. <laughs> Yeah, like if you put this record up against something like the newest sort of sedimentum record last year which is like dark heavy but those records have a kind of oversaturation in tone that i think feels very deliberate um when i listen to this dead congregation release even though relative to the bands that it sort of came after it was incredibly heavy. I don't feel that way like now listening to it. That you can see how often younger bands have sort of gone to this well and an attempt to sort of heighten the experience have just attempted to turn the dial, you know, to, you know, whatever, Max hoping to find or recreate the magic that was generated during this time period. Um, and it, it, to me, it doesn't have the same kind of currency. So, but that's clearly something that is present here on this record is the voicing for the guitar work specifically is a departure towards something a bit more in that dark, heavy, evil sounding Northeast death metal. <laughs> here um i wanted to bring in uh is at least from this slide um and to, to sort of tie into that note about relative to the sound that you hear often now especially with the drumming performance i can hear that this band was a at least for the most part, I think three members come for it, come from in veracity. And they have enough sort of instrumental chops um, where I can hear like at least they have the kind of headroom in terms of instrumental skill set to play in a band like that while still operating within a dead congregation sound. Um, that's a, abundantly clear to me listening to this record is uh, they're also the drumming performance while not, you know, I would not associate it with all these sort of negative connotations, but it does feel fast and punishing in a way that I don't think I'd associate with modern what other um uh, death metal of today or the past five years let's say 
um, I, I can feel like this has enough sort of connective tissue or DNA shared with a band that was operating from the early to mid 2000s. So um, it's just an interesting sort of note, rediscovering and re-listening to this record the past couple of weeks about like, man, I first listened to this and I thought it was the heaviest, you know, the heaviest thing I'd listened to in a long time. And, you know, definitely was channeling that sort of incantation rotted death metal sound. And now I listen to it and I'm like, man, I, I can hear a little bit more of like the, the, some tech death buried at least in terms of how fluid this record sort of moves. Um, it, it doesn't sound as chunky or rudimentary as I think a lot of m newer death metal bands, like they're much more practiced musicians than I think they probably get credit for. And uh, it's all over this record. Um, there's a, a couple of other additional elements that I think make this important. Um, I do want to like, I kind of touched on the incantation emulation side of things, which I think are for me personally, I'm so burnt out on newer bands using them as influences. Um, I'm just done with it, <laughs> but the other time thing that's going on here are the more experimental, you know, I mentioned mitochondrian, um, but like antediluvian is another band that's coming out. I think I mentioned impetuous ritual um, is coming around. Portal is, is one of the most polarizing bands, which is important to at least mention them during this time period. So, the reason I bring that up is Dead Congregation never gets that experimental. They're a bit more straightforward, but there's moments on this record where you can see them tapping into something a bit more dissident or atonal or challenging in terms of like guitar feedback um, that's playing with atmosphere. And I think that's a key factor for a lot of the more experimental bands from this era. Evangelist is another one that comes to mind immediately. Um, they never quite get there. And I, I think to associate them with those bands, it'd probably be an overstep. But I do want to at least like make the point that this was also operating and was able to, because of their willingness to introduce sort of more ritualistic elements, I think they have more sort of atmospheric reach than they're giving credit for. Um, and then they can't, you know, the choral vocals or the chanting sort of Greek Orthodox elements are important here. Um, and that definitely drives home sort of the emotional sort of spiritual connection that they were incorporating within death metal. But when you, add in these sort of like wandering guitar parts that are sort of tonally challenging um, and a clear sort of like uh, pierce through all the weight that they're generating. Um, that factored in with these sort of long drawn out passages. I mean, I think so the title track and so Graves of the Archangels and the closer teeth into red, you know, eclipse eight minutes. Um, and I think th they do so in a way that does not sort of move into death doom territory. Um, specifically, like people would talk about because incantation was, or we're playing in a heavy sort of slow murky um, style. It often got associated with doom, but 
if you look at the, the way their actual songs are structured and the way they play out, they aren't quite doom, right? And Dead Congregation takes that, but they expand on that by introducing more atmospheric elements, you know, not just sort of you they're they're moving into this experimental side of death metal a little bit they're also incorporating their own greek sort of spiritualism all those factors come together to make a great record and you know we talk about on our on the album club closing a record with like an emphatic um signature memorable moment the closing you know minute with the church bells that sort of explode back into this sort of riff refrain on uh, teeth into red. Classic stuff. It's it's such an amazing way to close out a record. Um, and I, I still I wait for it. Right. It's like the, the bells toll, and then it's they, they speed up in terms of cadence. And then it's reintroduced on the fourth sort of, bell clang the blast beat comes back in with the riff an incredible way to to end a record and um i, th I think those closing moments help to solidify its place in history So we're going to wrap up here. I've kind of talked at length about whether death metal is, I, I, I don't see it going anywhere and, and maybe <laughs> I'm getting old enough to where, uh, I, I just personally am wanting something different. Um, I don't feel it's slowing. I, I still think people are fans are going to pick up more and more death metal, but so I, I guess, in closing, what I do want to at least drive home, and, and hopefully I've been able to kind of connect the dots here, is yes, I am exhausted for the amount of death metal that sounds alike right now. Um, but it didn't emerge out of nowhere or without good cause. So the decade that preceded it full of tech death i mean that had run its course from the mid 90s until you know here i'm, I'm saying around 20 2007 2008 um so a turn towards something that was heavier and had a glimpses more towards the sound of the past was needed and people were hungry for it and it felt like a unique and special moment in death metal history at least um, but we're talking about something that started, you know, over 15 years ago, really. And the fact that we are still having that same conversation is a sign that the genre has not evolved. You know, if you think about seven churches, if you want to say that's the first death metal record to come out in 1985, you fast forward 16 years to 2001 you know death metal sounded so different um by comparison to what seven churches was the amount of evolution that it went from from 1985 to 2001 and whether you can say that's a bad or a good side of death metal is totally up for debate but i think what's undeniable is that it was so it was incredibly different they were worlds apart here I am talking about, you know, Graves of the Archangels. Um, bands are still chasing this record, in my opinion. They still want this kind of legitimacy and currency and status within the genre's history. Um, and the fact that the genre has not been able to sort of move past this time period, um, I, I, the, from where it is in 2008 to 2024, I, I don't I don't see the same level of growth. 
or willingness to take chances. Um, and if man, if that brings back more technical death metal, or I'm waiting for the next, you know, bands from the late nineties that I love, you know, I'm personally championing that cause. If we get more angel corpse, if we get more vital remains, if we get more iniquity, if we get more intestine balsam, if whatever bands from that era from the late nineties, if we get more Anata, like, I, yes, I will take that, please. More bands from that era, Centurion, Rebellion. If that sound comes back, Azareth, I'm going on here. I, I need to stop, right? But what there is something that is very true, at least for me, anecdotally, on a personal and emotional level, which was I was fundamentally on board with where this genre was in terms of the direction it was going, the bands that were coming out, you know, 10 years ago. Um, but by 2004, 2000, 2014, 2015, I had my, my interest, you know, has started to fade. And in 2024, yeah, um, I think there's something that needs to change. So I don't know what band will be, you know, their generation's dead congregation graves the archangels. But for me, this record is the flashpoint. It is the moment in death metal's history in the 21st century that ultimately shifted the direction for the genre the whole as a whole and still has had a tremendous impact um, in terms of what the genre sounds like today, some 16 years later. So dead congregation, I mean, congratulations on putting on potentially one of the most important death metal records of the 21st century. Um, I hope, you know, we get another record from the band, but I know they've got a bunch of stuff going on. I've got, you know, Embrace of Thorns playing in the background. They've got Nuclear Winter Records signing new bands. So I think Burial Hordes is a, is a record that came out last year that shares some members. Anyway, um, I just want to take a moment to one, you know, take like congratulate this band on releasing this record and over the 16 years, all that um, they've achieved. And if any recognition continues to come their way, it is a hunt fundamentally in a hundred percent without a doubt deserved. Um, the congregation graves of the archangels. I said my piece got on my soapbox and talked about the state of death metal. I hope you guys enjoy this. Um, it's a little bit something different for the Cut Your Tea series. Until next time, you can always catch me on the Heavy Metallurgy Album Club on Wednesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, I'll have some more stuff coming your way, some more Cut Your Teeth 2000s death metal. Until then, I'll see you guys later.